Thank you, Kwan Loy and the Onzom for leading us in a time of worship. It's wonderful indeed that we can gather as a church to thank the Lord for His faithfulness unto us for all 54 years. In a moment's time, I do want to introduce our guests and our guest preacher for today. But I thought it would be important for us to also take note of some apologies. Uh, track President, uh, Reverend Stan Lee, as well as our track Vice President, Dr. Cha Fong Fong, are away in Sweden. Uh, they are there for the World Methodist Conference. And so they've sent their apologies for not being able to join us in our celebrations. But we thank them for sending us their well wishes. In fact, this morning, uh, our Vice President texted me and said, uh, happy anniversary to Tropayo Methodist Church on the 54th anniversary. And so we are thankful uh, for uh, how they keep us in their thoughts, even while being in another time zone and in Sweden. Uh, but we also want to thank the Lord for some guests amongst us that He has brought into our midst. And I do want to welcome our uh, track lay leader and his wife, uh, Mr. Henry Tan, as well as uh, Gyok Cheng. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you will notice later that actually uh, Henry has come with crutches. And so even while you know, he's uh, having a sports injury, he's still here to celebrate God's goodness together with us. So we're thankful for Mr. Henry and for Gyok Ching. Um, we are also thankful for our preacher for today. Uh, but as I turn my eyes towards uh, our founding pastor, uh, I realize that our founding pastor is here today with us as well. Uh, He's actually having a small, uh, a bit of a pain uh, and a lingering flu, but he has made the effort to come all the way here to celebrate God's goodness for 54, and for 54 years. So we are thankful that uh, Pastor Michael has come and made the, really the effort to come and join us. Thank you so much, Pastor Michael. Our guest preacher today has uh, shared God's word with us before, and so he's no stranger to us. Uh, he is none other than Dr. Isaac Lim, as well as his wife, Dr. Shirley Lim, who is here with us as well. So we are thankful for them. Thank you, Dr. Isaac and Dr. Shirley. Dr. Isaac, I was just telling him this morning, has been a pastor longer than I've been alive. <laughs> he joined the ministry in 1972 and has been pastoring for over 30 years before he retired in 2004. Uh, and since then, he has continued to be in ministry, uh, pastoring many, many uh, individuals and churches who have always known him as pastor, as well as track president. He was our track president for 12 years in the past, and we are thankful and grateful that we can have him today. He continues to uh, mentor uh, younger pastors like myself and many others, and so we do see him as our pastor and our track president in all these years. And he has seen, of course, many years of his ministry. He has seen diff all the different churches, how God has been faithful to all the different churches all these years in track and uh, also in the general conference. And so we are thankful that today he will come and share with us the promise of God's faithfulness. Can you join me in welcoming Reverend Dr. Isaac Lim? Thank you, Pastor. Good morning. I want to sing of the goodness of God. Don't you want to do that as well? My wife and I are so happy to join you in your celebration of the 54th anniversary of this church. I was thinking about this church and I realized that when it all began, I was in Trinity Theological College as a student. That's over 54 years ago. But we praise God that through the years, God has been faithful. And we want to wish you God's abundant blessings and the joy of his presence as you seek to honor him and be his witnesses in this community and certainly beyond. 
It is also my joy this morning to note the presence of Reverend Michael Wong. I remember the 70s, when this church began, as it were. I was a third-year student at Trinity Theological College. And I remember the work of Reverend Michael Wong. Pioneer pastor, pioneer work. Nothing of that sort was, had been done here in this community. And we want to honor his faithfulness and dedication to the task entrusted to him out of which birth to a Pio Methodist church with him as the first pastor 54 years ago. Ren, Ren Wong, thank you so very much. I want to thank your pastor, the Reverend Benjamin Lee, for his friendship and for his gracious invitation to speak at this service. I've known Reverend Lee for several years now, and I want to pray God's blessings on him and the church, and that the anointing of the Spirit will continue to rest on him as he ministers in this place. You know, pastors serve the church. But the church, in many ways, develops and nurtures their pastors. And you have three of them here. And what they will be, what they will be in years to come, will be a reflection of your investment in their lives. You have been blessed. And my prayer is that you have been blessed to bless, and may these, your pastors, be blessed by you. I feel like this morning to reflect on God's, on the promise of God's faithfulness as articulated in Scripture. And I've chosen as our text a passage from Jeremiah 29 verses 10 through 14. Now, Jeremiah 29 comes at a very challenging moment in the history of the people of Judah. Now, you remember that in 587 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon ransacked Jerusalem and sent the population of Jerusalem into exile in Babylon. And in the midst of chaos, in the midst of commotion, national humiliation and defeat, Jeremiah writes to the people with a message from God. Now, a rather unpopular message because it ran against the grain of prevailing expectations. But nonetheless, a message from God. And he writes, For thus says the Lord, When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, 
declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. And then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. This is the word of God. You know, the essence of this message was that the people would remain in Babylon for the next 70 years. And when the 70 years were over, the people would return to Jerusalem. And we know from the book of Ezra that the exile ended way beyond the 70 years were up, or way before the 70 years were up. In fact, in 538 BC, when Cyrus, the Persian king, captured Babylon, he allowed the Jewish people exiled in Babylon to return to Jerusalem. You see, God made a promise to his people when he said, I will visit you. When he said, I will bring you back. And God remained faithful to his promise in bringing back his people to Jerusalem. On this 54th church anniversary, we are made conscious of God's faithfulness as we reflect on his goodness in the years gone by. And we say, I will sing of the goodness of God. From a little preaching point, And I tell you, it was little, yeah. It was a little shop house in, in the HDB estate. From this little preaching point, God has made Topayo Methodist Church a beacon of light in this community and beyond. You know, almost everyone living in this community knows where the church is. You go around and ask people, where is Topayo Methodist Church? And they will tell you where it is. And we can't but recognize the faithfulness of God. In this meditation, I want for us to consider three significant thoughts about the promise of God's faithfulness that we can draw from this text in Jeremiah 29. And the first thought is this. The promise of God's faithfulness is firmly anchored on the foundation of who he is. It's firmly anchored on the foundation of who God is. You see, who he is makes all the difference to what he promises. 
The character of God as a loving, righteous, and faithful God makes it incumbent of, on, on Him to honour His promises and to stand by His people in their journey of faith. I was looking at your church's website and chance upon your vision or mission statement which says, Encounter to love is there on, uh, on your wall, yeah? Encounter to love. Your journey of faith, as you minister in this community, is to share with them the love of God as you encounter it. Now, for, for many of you, the encounter of God's love has been real, both in the mountaintop moments of your life as well as the valley moments of your life. Joy, as well as pain, have enabled you to experience the abundance of God's grace and the abundance of God's love. The vicissitudes of life have drawn you closer to the, to the Master and your love for Him has matured and deepen. Now, being exiled to Babylon was a, 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 a very low moment in the experience of the Jewish nation. Yet as you read scripture, you will notice that the company of God did not depart from them. God even made a promise. And he says in verse 10, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. Bring you back to Jerusalem. Now I would like for us to take cognizance of this pronoun I. I will. The pronoun I. I. Now, the eye here is not the eye of a human person, but the eye of God. When a human person makes a promise, he or she may or may not keep the promise, but when God makes a promise, he will keep it. Now, this eye of God appears in various parts of Scripture. You remember when Moses asked God, who should I say have sent me to deliver the people out of Egypt? And God said to Moses, just tell them, I am who I am has sent me to you. Just tell them that. Now, when we move on to the New Testament, you will notice that Jesus, the God who became flesh, also used the divine I to highlight who he is. And Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Or I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Or I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Or I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The divine eye. But you will also notice that whenever God speaks, the evil one also speak. God's voice 
is always challenged by an opposing voice. And we see that in the Garden of Eden, God s- speaks to Adam and Eve, and the devil also, in the form of a serpent, also speaks to them. And here in this book of Jeremiah, we see the same thing happening. The prophecy of the 70-year exile is first mentioned not in Jeremiah 29, but Jeremiah, Jeremiah 25, verse 11 and 12. But Satan uses a man of standing a man of standing in the community to declare a different message. And what one such person was a prophet by the name of Hananiah. Whilst God, through the prophet Jeremiah, was telling the people that they would be in Babylon for 70 years Hananiah was sharing a different message. God says 70 years. Hananiah says two years. And you find it in Jeremiah 28, verse 2 through 4, where Hananiah makes a prophetic utterance. Now remember, he's making a prophetic utterance in the name of God. And he says, Star says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon within two years. I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. I will also bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the exiles from Judah who went to be Babylon declares the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Now, if you, when you look at this text, you will notice that Hananiah was using the name of God to authenticate his prophetic utterance. In fact, he was using the name of God flippantly and in vain. Now, let me say this, yeah? I think it's dangerous yeah? to use the name of God flippantly. I've heard some people use thus saith the Lord a little too flippantly. God says this, God says this, and they they make public statements. Exodus 20 verse 7 says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Unless you're very sure, don't use the name of the Lord in vain. Don't say, thus saith the Lord. You know, the consequence of this false prophecy was Hananiah's quick demise. In Jeremiah 28, 17, it says, In that same year, in the seventh month, the prophet Hananiah died. You know, Jeremiah was very clear as to who the people were to listen to. And he wrote to the people saying, and you find that in Jeremiah Jeremiah 28, 
29. He said, do not let your prophets and your diviners who, among, who are among you deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. You know, in our lives and ministry, we also hear two voices. We hear God's voice. And often when we hear God's voice, we also hear another voice. And the, and the source of the other voice could be ourselves, reflecting our preference, our friends, our loved ones, false prophets, or even the devil. And very often these voices run contrary to the voice of God. God says, stop. The other voice says, go. God says, love. The other voice says, hate. God says, turn around. The other voice says, hold your ground. And very often, the eye of God is usurped by the eye of men. The carnal eye usurps the divine eye. God says, I have a plan. The other voice also says, I have a plan too. Which plan do you follow? And you know, often because of our willfulness, we often end up with plan B. When God's desire is for us to have plan A. Now, is such a battle raging in your life today? Is such a battle raging in the church today? What is God saying? Now, often, the battle is not between good and bad. That's quite straightforward, right? The battle is often between good and good. For example, do you embark on a renovation project because the church is growing? Or do you give your money to missions? You see, the church is growing and you need more space. So there's a group who says, I think it's important for us to extend our facilities. There's another group that would say to you, no, 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 give the money to missions. It's between good and good. The question is, what is God saying? And that is what counts. Now the challenges, or the challenge becomes even more complex when you find yourself in Babylon and where everything around you is falling apart. And you know that your one decision will affect your all the other decisions. Now, let me, let me put it this way. Yeah? Babylon is not the nicest place to be in. Not the nicest place to be in. Babylon is beyond our comfort zone. Babylon is a place of testing and a place of pain. And some of you may already be in Babylon even as I speak. You're in a place of pain. You 
You see, Babylon can, can end up as a place where we harden our hearts and turn our backs to God because of the difficulties we go through or a place of repentance and turning around. You know, for the people of Judah, Babylon was God's way of helping them turn back to Him and trust Him again. They were a chosen race who had strayed away from God. It's, it's just like us, saved by grace, yet sinning away. You see, Babylon can be a place of molding and growing as we discover the hand of a loving God leading us across the rough terrains of life so that we can have a great future. God has allowed us to go through the experience of Babylon because he wants us to encounter him in order to mature and grow in him. He says to you, it will be for a season but I will deliver you. And I want to say to those who, who are going through the experience of Babylon or the, the experience of challenges and pain, that it will be, a, be for a season and God will deliver you. The question is, can you trust him for that? And so... The promise of God's faithfulness is anchored on the foundation of who He is, the divine I. Can you trust the divine I? Secondly, the promise of God's faithfulness is entrenched in His plans. God's plans are certainly better than our plans. And if God is faithful, His plans for us must be good. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. To give you a future and a hope. Now, if God knows the plans he has for our lives, he certainly knows how the plan will unfold as well. And the challenge for us is to trust him and to allow him to unfold his plans for our lives, especially in tough moments. I think in good moments we have no problems, right? Right? But we do have problems when we are going through tough times. Because we don't know what's going to happen. It's, it's like this chorus which says, Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Now, it is interesting to note that the Hebrew word for plan, okay, the Hebrew word for plan can also be translated as thought. Thought. In the King James Version, version it reads, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end, thoughts. In other words, God's thoughts are positive thoughts, thoughts for our welfare and not for harm, to give us a future with hope, even when things look really bad at the present. You know, there's a parallel passage in Isaiah 
that helps us understand the, 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 this di dimension of divine thought. And you find that in Isaiah 55, verse 6, where it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Now, there are two things I want you to note here in this, in this passage in Isaiah. First of all, God's thoughts are not your thoughts. And so God's plans may not be your plans. We will not fully comprehend God's thoughts because we are limited in our understanding. We do not see what God sees. We are limited in our ability to see beyond the present. You see, there is here in this text a challenge of faith and trust, and that is why many of us falter and fail. From a human perspective, it is easier to trust something tangible you can see than something intangible. And that is why we often run away, yeah? even as a church, we often run away from costly and challenging projects, even when we believe God is telling us so. Because our faith anchor is in ourselves and not in a great God. Our, our faith anchor is in ourselves and not in a great God. And so we, we dare not do things that God wants us to do because we are afraid it will fail. I always, always tell pastors and churches that if you want to see the glory of God, you go do something that you believe only God can do. Because when it happens, you will see the glory of God. You know, you look at the Exodus journey as an example, the Exodus journey. What was the desire of God? The desire of God was to give the people of Israel the promised land. The process was a seemingly endless journey through the desert. And that resulted in rebellion and a 40-year journey in the wilderness. And all they could see was not milk and honey, but literally sand, sand, and more sand. You see, for the Israelites on their journey, faith men have believing that they would that there would be a beautiful land beyond the sand. And it is not always easy to see the promised land when all you can see now is the desert. Is that where you are today? You wake up every morning and you see the desert. And so we need to recognize, first of all, that God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Now, secondly, there's a correlation 
between thoughts and plans. Your thoughts, your thoughts determine your plans. Your thoughts determine your plans. Isn't that true? Are you still with me? Yeah? You're still thinking? Okay. Let me give you an, give, give you an illustration. Yeah? How many of you are married? Okay, let me talk to the man first. Lah. There was a time in your life when you met a beautiful girl. Now, whether it's still beautiful, I don't know, but but (laughs) you met a beautiful girl, right? So in your mind, you say, hmm, wow, hmm. I'd like to get to know her, right? That's in your thoughts, right? So, your thoughts determine your plans. So what do you do? You find ways and means to get to know her, right? You didn't. You you didn't do it? You, You did, right? Yeah, Henry says, yeah, so it so, uh, must be true. So you, you did something, or you, your, your thoughts determine your plans, right? Until she became your wife, right? So at least your thoughts worked out. Yeah, you, you, you uh, determine your plans, which resulted in you marrying this young lady. That's what you think, like maybe it's the other way around. Yeah? Maybe your wife saw this man. That's her thoughts. I want to get to know this man. And so she planned it all out. And you're married not because you thought about it, she thought about it. That's also possible. And so, if you look at this text, you'll understand why Isaiah said, let the unrighteous men abandon their thoughts so that their wicked thoughts will not end up with wicked plans. And because God's thoughts are to prosper and not to harm, His plans will invariably give us a future and a hope. And, and we need to trust God for that. If, if we think of God as a supreme being who cannot who cannot be trusted, then our plans will not feature him as significant. We need to trust God. God is saying to the Jewish people, all will be well. You will need to trust me. When the 70 years are over, you will return to Jerusalem. Now, if you were an elderly person, yeah. exile to Babylon. Your question to God would be, how does that help me? 70 years is a long time, right? If you're a senior citizen like myself, yeah, I'm over 70. And God says to me, in 70 years' time, you will return to Jerusalem. I would say, what for? I would be dead by then. Right? You think about it. 70 years. And 70 years would mean that majority of the adults who had left Jerusalem as exiles would be dead. And those who were taken to Babylon as kids would be mature adults. And those born in Babylon would have no clue as to what Jerusalem is all about. But would certainly enjoy a future and a home. Now, sometimes corporate blessing may not be for us. 
but for our children and our children's children. And so we need to take a long view. But how does this passage give us a future and hope? Especially we are senior citizens. And I believe the answer is in this one word, welfare. And this one word, welfare, yeah, is the Hebrew word, shalom. <clears throat> Are you familiar with the word shalom? That's what it means. And shalom for many of us means peace. But I want to say that shalom is a loaded word. Shalom is a loaded word. It also means prosperity, it means safety, it means rest, it means health, it means welfare, it means favor. That is shalom. In other words, God's thoughts for you are thoughts of peace, prosperity, safety, rest, health, welfare, and favor. And if these are in His thoughts, they invariably would be in His plans. And isn't that what we need as we face the very challenges as seniors? Don't we too need a future and a hope? And I notice there are quite a few seniors here. And I want to say to you seniors, because I'm a senior too, that God loves you. And He wants you to have a future and a home. What are your needs? Peace? Prosperity? I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel, uh, which is always transactional. But I want to believe that God can prosper us by just blessing us. Is it safety that you need? Is it rest? Is it health? Is it favor? That's us. That's what God does for us. But what about the church? What, are, what about the corporate plan? Your pastor says that the vision of the church as you encounter the love of God is to serve one another, right? The experience of shalom can be a reality when you begin to serve one another. God could use you to bring his message of shalom to someone who is, who is finding himself or herself in Babylon. And I tell you, sometimes it is tough to be in Babylon, but when, 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 we, have, when we learn to serve one another, it makes things so much easier. And, and so my prayer is that you will make this happen today in your home and in the church community as well. God is saying, your needs are already in my thoughts and hands in my plans, and it is in the fulfillment of his plans that his faithfulness is revealed. And so the promise of God's faithfulness is entrenched in his plans. And finally, let me close with this thought. The promise of his faithfulness becomes a reality when an alignment takes place between our thoughts and God's thoughts and our plans and His plans. And I like this portion where, where, where Jeremiah says, then you will call upon Him and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore 
your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. That's a restoration. And maybe some of us need that message today. God, you will restore. God says, I will hear you. I will be found when you seek me. That means our thoughts and our plans must align with God's thoughts and plans in order for a powerful convergence to take place. And in simple terms, if there's a blockage in that alignment, there will be a hindrance to this convergence. And so the question we ask is, is there a sin that must be confessed? Is there something in your life that is hindering that convergence? Babylon was an attempt to bring God's people back into, al into alignment. Jesus came to do the same, to bring us into alignment with God. Calvary is God's way of making that alignment possible. Christ died for us so that we may be free to converge with the plans and thoughts of God. God wants you to call on Him. He says He will hear. He wants you to seek Him because <clears throat> He will be found. What is God saying to you this morning? The promise of God's faithfulness is anchored on the foundation of who He is. He is the divine eye. Remember that. The promise of God's faithfulness is entrenched in His plans. What is He saying to you about His plans for your life? The promise of God's faithfulness becomes an existential reality when an alignment takes place between our thoughts and God's thoughts and our plans and His plans. I love this stanza. In this hymn which says, Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changes not, thy compassion they feel not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Let us pray. <clears throat> oh God, our Father, we <clears throat> thank you for your grace, your love. Thank you that you are ever so faithful, ever so loving. And from time to time, we forget that you are the God who keeps his promises. Thank you for this church for 54 years of your leading and blessing, for the many pastors who have served this community, served this church, we give you thanks. Thank you for many who are here who have grown with this church. Lord, will you reach out, touch them and bless them. And for those of us who are going through a very painful and difficult time in our lives, teach us what it means to trust in you because your promise never ceases and you never fail. And so, Father, we just thank you. We entrust ourselves and the church into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.